Hello, everyone. Welcome to our August webinar. I am Cece. I'm the president of this chapter of the San Joaquin Native Plant Society. Um, today, we welcome Madeline Yancey, and she's going to talk about native plants of the San Luis National Wildlife Refuge and the wildlife benefits. Um, she works at the San Luis National Wildlife Complex, and she is a park ranger there. But before the meeting, I just want to talk about a few things. Um, Mike, do, were you going to say anything? Uh, yeah, but go ahead and go through your, your spiel, and then uh, I'll talk right before Madeline does. Okay, so I'll let, I'll let Mike talk later. Um, basically, this event will be recorded, as you got the notification just a little bit ago. Um, it'll be uploaded shortly to our YouTube channel, um, which I'll post later in the comments for you, for you all to find. Um, it's also on our um, website. If you go to our website and go to the online presentation section, you can see all of our upcoming presentations listed there, as well as um, our previous presentations that are recorded on YouTube. Um, so yeah, here's a list of some of our past presentations. Um, we've had quite a few and they're all on our YouTube channel. So I'll just uh, breeze through these lists, the different presentations, but you can see those all on our YouTube channel. Um, but the ones that are coming up, September 11th, we are going to have part two of a presentation we had last year, um, Reliable California Native Plants. And October 9th, we're going to have an interesting one about fish. That'll be cool. Fish and native plants. And November 13th, we'll also have um, another speaker coming back again, Cynthia, to talk about arranging California native plants and bouquets, garlands, and wreaths. December, we will not have a, a webinar. And January 8th, we will have Mike. Um, our membership chair talking about Calscape. And also on February 12th, we'll have Tina. She's also in our um, group and she's gonna be talking about water, water everywhere and nowhere. So again, you can see all these things in our YouTube, which I'll put in the comments in a little bit for you all. And these, this webinar happens the second Monday, typically the second Monday of each month. Um, if you have any ideas for a webinar, let Cynthia know. She's the one who organizes all these webinars. She's just out of town right now. So I am doing this little spiel for her. And with that, I will hand it over to Mike. Cool. Thank you. Let me go ahead and uh, share my screen now. Uh, there we go. All right, so uh, hopefully you can see my, uh, no, what, what a few, there we go. All right, so I, I just shared uh, some notes from my uh, from my presentation in the chat. Um, so uh, th these are some of the stuff I'll be talking about. I wanted to give you an introduction to our chapter, the North San Joaquin Valley chapter of the California Native Plant Society. The California Native Plant Society is a statewide organization and you can join it for a regular mem individual membership of $50. Uh, Flora and Artemisia Media Magazines uh, get, ben um, get benefits such as, you get benefits such as discounts at certain nursery sales and such. You get those two magazines um, and uh, you get to join two different chapters of the California Native Plant Society. If you'd like to join the North San Joaquin Valley chapter and one other, such as the Santa Clara Valley chapter, Sacramento Valley chapter, or others, it will be an option when you go to the link on the slide, cnps.org slash membership. Now, we hope that you join 
us here in the North San Joaquin Valley chapter and whichever other chapter you feel a kinship with. I said the membership was $50, but there is an option to choose other price options and higher membership levels for uh, are available for those who are able to help the organization more financially. It is a great cause. The regular membership link is right there, cnps.membership.org um, slash membership. Remember, this link is the link to join up. I should point out that the long bar at the bottom labeled other is for those who want to choose another amount. And notice that the bottom of that barrel is actually $25. Not everyone can afford $50, but we have removed uh, membership level titles and that includes that low income level title. So if you wanna join for $25 with the membership, um, uh, Sorry, uh, if you want to join for uh, $50 or for the $25 with the magazines and all, you can just, uh, you just can't afford the $50 membership. You, we still want you to have the opportunity to join us. Just fill in that amount, um, the minimum of $25 and you're in. So the fifth edition of our newsletter was sent out just a few days ago. Volume five of the Oak Branch was sent out to all of our members via email. This was our bird issue edition with articles on uh, how you can help birds with native plants and our photo pages with views of the beautiful Akerson Meadow in Yosemite, the location of July's field trip. Cece Hurst Hart, uh, who you just heard from, our president and big time field trip leader. Oh, actually that's from last week. Uh, let's see, we had a field trip coming uh, that was just held this morning in Dry Creek. Not to get and, uh, that. <laughs> the uh, photo that, that was, was uh, fast. <laughs> yeah, it was fast. Well, um, and our next field trip is on Sunday, September 10th. Come explore the local flora and fauna of our latest for our nature's latest nature walk. We will meet at Horseshoe Road Recreation Area in Oakdale this coming Sunday. Uh, not this coming Sunday. Um, it's the Sunday of. Uh, September 10th um, at nine o'clock. We, our guides will discuss the native trees and shrubs found along the trail. As always, we will also be on the lookout for bugs, uh, birds, bugs, and any other interesting things that we discover. All ages are welcome. And I should point out that we intend to do everything by email. We recognize that there are some people who actually prefer US mail, and for those who are inconvenienced, we do apologize, but we don't have the financial or volunteer base to put the newsletter out that way. CNPS has asked all chapters to find ways of reducing carbon uh, usage and saving all that paper is one of our contributions. If this is a true problem, let us know. So far, no one has complained. And if you are on our list, you should have received the, that newsletter. But if you got missed somehow, please let me know in chat. Um, during the presentation. And to be put on our list, just let me know, we want our newsletter to get out to everyone. That's our mission, to promote native plants around our region. And our best way of doing that is to keep native plants on everyone's minds through events and presentations and gardening. So we wanna keep those of you who haven't joined the statewide organization in the loop so that perhaps you can join us for an event or two and to remind you that we are here. Why carry about native plants? We are finding out more and more each day about the true need to restore environment as much as we can. The man who has been trying to explain the need for native plants with the most uh, eloquence so far is Doug Ptolemy, a professor from Delaware. He's written three books on the subject, uh, maybe four, all of which uh, circle around the theme that we have been damaging our environment dramatically, but there is hope in native plants. 95% of all birds feed insects to their young. Caterpillars are an important component of that diet, and caterpillars cannot live on non-native plants with very few exceptions. Native plants are critical to the ecosystem in a backyard with no native plants, and that is a devastatingly high percentage of them, are ecological dead zones. Planting native plants in, your, in our yards helps moths, butterflies, native bees, and other pollinators and therefore birds and the web goes on and on. 
Our cities need not be devoid of butterflies, moths, and native bees. For more information about this, we can watch a one-hour video that knocked me over like a brick. This is a talk sponsored by our local Audubon chapters just this past January. The link is in chat. And if you have any questions during Madeline's presentation, please go ahead and put them in chat, um, and we will uh, answer all of the questions at the end. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Cece, um, who will then go ahead and get Madeline started, and I will be in chat for those with questions or comments. Uh, Madeline, you can begin. Okay. All righty, good evening, everybody. Um, as our moderators already said, my name is Madeline Yancey. I'm the park ranger at the San Luis National Wildlife Refuge Complex. And I know that the talk this evening is gonna be about native plants of the complex, um, but I'm gonna start out with just hopefully what's gonna be a very brief introduction to the refuge complex for those who maybe have never been there or just not familiar with the complex and uh, what it is and what it does. So, uh oh. So, uh, first of all, the refuges of the San Luis complex are managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, a federal government agency. And I always like to start out presentations with what our mission is because it helps people understand a little bit about how national wildlife refuges are different from places like national parks or state parks and other public land that are managed by government agencies. So our mission here at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is working with others to conserve, protect, and enhance fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for the continuing benefit of the American people. And the, our motto in the National Wildlife Refuge system is we are where wildlife comes first. So all other uses of National Wildlife Refuge land is secondary to wildlife and their habitats. So how do we carry out our mission? Uh, we do it with a network of protected public lands called the National Wildlife Refuge System. And this uh, map of the United States shows that network of lands, all those little pinky purpley dots are national wildlife refuges. Currently, there are more than 560 national wildlife refuges. And then there are other public lands in this system called um, wildlife management areas and waterfowl production areas. They're all part of the refuge system. Um, you can see by looking at the map that every state in the union has at least one national wildlife refuge, and there are refuges even in our major U.S. territories like Puerto Rico, Guam, the Virgin Islands. Uh, we even have national wildlife refuges out in the ocean, Midway Island, which was a major um, important island during World War II, is now a national wildlife refuge. Um, it always makes me chuckle when I give presentations to school kids. Third graders are really adept at pointing out that North Dakota has no national wildlife refuges. And I just said that there's one in every state. Well, that's because North Dakota has so many that they had to blow it up down here. Um, you notice that the wildlife refuges are concentrated along the Pacific coast up the central part of the country and up the eastern seaboard. And that's because those areas are the routes for the major North American flyways. And the refuges are there to provide food, shelter, um, uh, food, shelter, um, and space, excuse me, food, water, shelter, and space for migratory birds uh, when they leave their summer breeding grounds and they head south to their wintering grounds. They need to be able to have safe places to rest and to eat along the way. So that's why the refuges are concentrated along those flyways. Um, I would mention here too that the National Wildlife Refuge System protects more than 150 million acres of land. The largest refuge in the system is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge up in uh, Northern Alaska and it is greater than 19 million acres. The second largest refuge in the system is the Desert National Wildlife Refuge next door in Nevada, and it's about one and a half million acres in size. 
This map shows, um, if you squint your eyes a little, you can see uh, right there, kind of in the center due east of the Monterey Bay are where the three refuges of this complex are. And to the right and down at the bottom, I uh, put a map of the California Floristic Province in there to show where these refuges sit in relation to the California Floristic Province, um, basically kind of smack dab in the middle of it. So the three refuges of the complex are the San Luis Refuge. That's where the visitor center is. We're about seven miles north of Los Banos. It was established in 1967. And then the Merced National Wildlife Refuge is about 10 miles due east of there, south of the city of Merced. It's the oldest refuge. It was established in 1951. And the San Joaquin River National Wildlife Refuge is the newest refuge in the complex and it's due west of the city of Modesto. It was established in 1987. This is a map that shows um, kind of the location of the refuges in relation to Merced County, um, kind of running, you see those dark blue areas. This one right here is the San Luis National Wildlife Refuge. These two little parts here and this one are the Merced National Wildlife Refuge. And then, Actually, this map does not show uh, the San Joaquin River Refuge because it's way up here, as I said, west of the city of Modesto. Um, these other lands, the green lands, are also protected wildlife habitat. They're managed by the state of California. These are state wildlife areas. And these light blue lands are owned by private landowners. Most of them are waterfowl hunt clubs. They are under conservation easement, a contract with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service under which the land is protected in perpetuity for wildlife habitat. So if you add all of these private lands, the state lands and the federal lands together, um, this area comprises about 200,000 acres of protected wildlife habitat. It's the largest contiguous chunk of wildlife habitat left in the state. And it sits right here in the middle of Merced County. Um, so why are we here? Um, the, these refuges were all established under different authorizing pieces of legislation, but to put it in a nutshell, um, we have the Migratory Bird Conservation Act, which basically says you need to protect habitat for migratory birds as they migrate between one country and another. Um, the Lee Act was a piece of legislation that uh, established the Merced National Wildlife Refuge basically to um, establish a national wildlife refuge so that they could lure the birds, the wintering waterfowl and geese and swans and cranes off of farmers' lands because they were eating the farmers out of house and home. It was not uncommon for a farmer to plant his field in the morning and by nightfall, every seed that he'd put in the ground was gone. Um, the Endangered Species Act authorized the establishment of the San Joaquin River National Wildlife Refuge on behalf of um, this little guy right here, the riparian brush rabbit, and firstly, this Aleutian cackling goose, which was declared um, endangered in the 1970s, but it has since been delisted. The riparian brush rabbit is still endangered. It's California's most endangered mammal. And then the other piece of legislation that comes into play with these refuges is the Emergency Wetlands Resources Act. And that basically just um, instructed uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to find wetlands that were still remaining, determine how degraded they were, what kind of shape they were in, and protect them, and to locate areas where wetlands could be reclaimed and restored. Um, after we finally, after a very, very long time, determined that wetlands were important. This is a picture that shows the Pacific Flyway. So our wildlife refuges are about right here. The, those dark spots, the bigger and the darker, means the more, um, uh, the greater population of migratory birds spend at least part of the year there. In our case, uh, the migratory waterfowl, ducks, geese, shorebirds, swans in the wintertime. But we don't just have migratory waterfowl. We have migratory songbirds, migratory raptors, um, a large number of migratory birds. <clears throat> So the presentation tonight is about native plants of the San Luis National Wildlife Refuge and their role in the ecosystem. 
And I want to say what this presentation is, and what it is, is an introduction to the native plants that visitors would most likely see when they visit the San Luis National Wildlife Refuge. And that could be at any time of the year. What this presentation is not is a comprehensive list of native plants on the refuge, because that would take many, many presentations. Um, it's not talking about uh, unique and specific communities of plants like vernal pole plants for existence. And the reason is because there again, that's a whole nother presentation on its own. And visitors are not likely to see them unless they specifically go looking for them. So that's why um, I didn't include plants like that. And there are there are a lot of plants that are not on this list that visitors might see any time they visit the refuge, but it got really, really long. So I had to cut something somewhere. So first of all, let's take a look at that uh, California floristic province. Here I'm showing inside that um, gold rectangle kind of where the refuges sit in relation to the province. And as I said, it sort of sits right smack dab in the middle of it. And some interesting um, facts about the California floristic province. It's a biodiversity hotspot. There are 36 recognized hotspots in the world, and one of them is this floristic province. 25% of the vegetation still in the province remains relatively pristine. And the province has a tremendously high rate of endemism. Of about 3,500 species of plants, 61% of them are endemic to the province. There's a tremendous number of vascular plants in the California floristic province. If you took um, the central United States, northeastern United States, and the adjacent areas of Canada, that's an area 10 times larger than this California floristic province. And yet this province contains more vascular plants than that other area that's 10 times the size. In addition to the um, all the 61% the of species that are endemic, um, it includes about 52 genera of plants that are endemic to the area. And of all the major habitat types in this province, and that includes things like native grasslands, vernal pool habitats, um, freshwater wetlands, and riparian woodlands, all of those major habitat types have now been reduced to about one to 5% of their historic ranges. So it's, it's pretty degraded. Um, I'll say just a few things so that I don't have to repeat it as we go through every single plant, um, what some of the roles of plants are in the habitat. And so if you kind of dig back a little and remember your high school botany or your high school science, Plants are primary producers. They photosynthesize, and through photosynthesis, they provide all the organic molecules um, for energy or food for the entire ecosystem. Plants are the base of the food chain. In fact, everything that humans eat comes directly or indirectly from plants. Plants provide shelter for wildlife, and you can think about any part of the plant you want all the way down to the roots. The roots, the trunks, the barks, the bark of the leaves, the branches, um, cavities within the trunks, the entire plant in many cases provides shelter to some kind of living organism. Plants stabilize our soil, particularly in areas that are prone to erosion like along string banks and the edges of wetlands. Plants filter our air and our water, and in some cases, they actually remove contaminants from the air and the water. And plants release oxygen. If it weren't for plants um, causing major changes to Earth's atmosphere way back when, we would not today have life on this planet as we know it. So why native plants? Why, you know, Plants in general, if it's a plant, it's good, right? But why is it so important to have native plants? Well, for one thing, local herbivores are specially adapted to feed on native plants. Um, in some cases, they will feed on only 
one or a few very specific plants, and you might think of the example of monarch butterflies, for example. Monarch caterpillars only feed on milkweeds. That's it. Um, native insects need native plants, and native birds and animals need native insects. If there's no native insects, then there are no forms of higher life. 37% um, of animal species worldwide are herbivorous insects. And insects are really efficient at converting plant tissue to insect tissue. And that insect tissue is high protein food for all kinds of other animals. A large percentage of the world's fauna depends entirely on insects in order to access the energy that's stored in plants. In fact, 98% of terrestrial bird species in North America feed their growing chicks insects. If there were no insects, then baby birds wouldn't survive. Um, more important things about native plants, native plants and native wildlife evolve together, all the way to considering things like the shapes and structures of flowers and the chemical content of the leaves are tailored specifically to the feeding habits of native wildlife. Native wildlife is accustomed or genetically hardwired to utilize native plants, whether it's for food or whether it's uh, in the case of different bird species that use different plant tissues like fluff or tendrils or leaves to incorporate into their nest building. Um, I kind of equate it to um, a person visiting a foreign country that they've never been before in a culture that is completely native to them. And they're given a plate full of food that looks kind of funny and it smells kind of funny. And you go, mm, I'm not going to try that. I have no idea what it is. I'm not sure if it tastes good. Uh, I'm not eating it. That's kind of the way I equate with native wildlife and native plants. They're not familiar with it. Their brains are not genetically hardwired to know that they can use it. So oftentimes plants in general aren't much benefit to them. The fruits and berries and nuts, the maturity of them is timed to the life cycles of native wildlife in order to fuel their migration. A good example of this is the ruby-throated hummingbird that migrates from the southeastern United States across the Gulf of Mexico to the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula. It takes a hummingbird about 18 hours to make that flight. And by the time he reaches the Yucatan Peninsula, his energy reserves are completely depleted. And that little hummingbird depends on certain species of plants to be blooming at the time that he shows up in the Yucatan, because if those flowers are not there, they have no food and they perish. So that's just one example of how they are timed um, perfectly to be able to utilize those plants. So let's start with some of the native plants at the refuge. As I said, the visitors are likely to see if they visit the refuge no matter what time of year. And the first one is the valley oak tree. And you might think of the oak tree as the king of trees. There have been lots of studies shown, um, done that show how much life a single oak tree, and I don't think it really matters what the species is, but how much life can be supported by a single oak tree. Estimates are that they support about 300 different species of animals, about 1,100 different species of plants, 700 different species of fungi, and about 5,000 different species of insects and invertebrates. The oak tree provides shelter, cover, protection from predators in the canopy, under the bark, in the cavities in the trees, um, in um, fallen oak logs and dead or dying trees, um, amphibians like salamanders and other invertebrates live in those decomposing logs. And they're really good at turning wood into humus. And then the humus goes into the soil and in turn feeds the soil, which feeds all of the invertebrates that live in the soil. And then that in turn feeds the plant communities that grow in the soil. And then we have the Fremont cottonwood tree. Um, the cottonwood tree is 
kind of iconic in the riparian woodlands of the Western United States. It's considered a keystone species. And a keystone species is a species that has an impact on the ecosystem that is far larger in comparison to its actual population in the ecosystem. So cottonwood trees are very fast growing. They're really tall, 60 feet or more. And those really tall trees are favored by birds like um, hawks and eagles and um, great horned owls for nesting sites. Cottonwood trees are wind pollinated, so they don't depend on insect pollinators, which means the flowers produce a whole lot of pollen and not a lot of nectar. But that pollen is used by all kinds of native bees, particularly ground nesting bees. They harvest the pollen and then they make pollen balls. And when they're forming their little um, egg chambers down in the ground, they provision the egg chamber with a ball of pollen and then they lay their egg in there and they seal the chamber up. When the larvae hatches out of the egg, they get their start by feeding on that pollen ball until they're ready to um, escape and make their way out of the egg chamber. Um, when cottonwood uh, trees drop big branches and limbs or logs fall over, um, oftentimes cottonwood trees are growing along the banks of rivers and creeks and streams and those logs will fall down into the water and they will um, trap sediments that are being washed down the river and those trapped sediment banks in turn become habitat for more aquatic plants. They also become little hiding places for fish fry like salmon that are traveling down the river making their way to the ocean. The cottonwood canopies provide shade over the water, which moderates the temperatures. And that's important for fish like salmon. The salmon fry cannot survive in water that's too warm. Um, the cottonwood trees and other trees improve the quality of water by taking up nutrients from decaying fish and decaying vegetation or uh, waste material that's been deposited in the water. So it helps to keep the quality of the water good. Um, cottonwood trees have very soft wood and large stands of cottonwoods have something called heart rot, which rots out the center of the tree. And when that heart rot occurs, then animals like woodpeckers are able to go in there and enlarge those cavities and create their nesting chambers. After the woodpeckers use the nesting chambers the first year, then other species of birds like maybe tree swallows or um, American kestrels will move in there. And sometimes if the holes are big enough, raccoons will come in and they will actually use them as um, roosting dens where they sleep during the daytime. So cottonwood trees can provide homes and shelter for lots of different animals. Um, beavers are particularly fond. One of their favorite foods is the cambium of cottonwood trees and willow trees. Um, the foliage, these trees are deciduous, so their foliage all falls to the ground in the wintertime, and that in turn becomes leaf litter that then provides food for a lot of aquatic invertebrates like stoneflies, mayflies, and caddisflies. These trees are ex uh, extremely tolerant to flooding and that siltation that I spoke about, and pretty long-lived. Cottonwood trees can live up to about 130 years. And then another common tree on the wildlife refuge is the black willow, also known as the Goodings willow. Willows in general have a huge impact on the ecosystem um, and even on humans through medicine, mythology, and even in our gardens. A lot of willows have been cultivated to be used in our gardens. Like the cottonwood trees, these survive really tough conditions and they're super easy to root. If you take a willow, a branch and you dig a hole and you stick the branch in the hole and keep it watered, it grows into a new willow tree. So what that means is that whenever pieces of willow trees break off, where they land on soil that's got some moisture in it, they'll sprout and make new willow trees. There are two hormones that are present in willow trees. Um, one has a big long fancy name called uh, called uh, endolibutric acid or IBA. 
Um, it's a rooting hormone. And then willow trees also have salicin, which is the precursor to aspirin. And salicin is involved with the plant's defenses or with its immune system. So it's believed that those two hormones protect the young uh, rooted sapling of the willow tree and help it to survive attacks from pathogen, pathogens and things that um, might cause it to not be able to survive. And an interesting thing is that cottonwood trees also have salicin in them, that precursor to aspirin. Um, so that that easily rooting characteristic of willows, and I think I might've mentioned this already, when willows topple or the limbs break off, they just readily sprout and they can form whole new thickets of willows. Unlike the cottonwood trees, willow trees produce nectar. So they um, attract all kinds of pollinators that are coming to harvest nectar. And they believe willows are the likely host for 177 different insects, um, including butterflies like the Western tiger swallowtail and the morning cloak. And then birds like least bills vireo and southwestern willow flycatcher love to nest in big, um, dense thickets of, of trees like black willow. Another willow that's on the refuge is the arroyo willow. And um, this one, I think of more as a shrub than a tree, although they call it a tree. It does sometimes get to tree size. As with other willows, many insects um, in these trees, both willows and cottonwood trees have gazillions of insects in them. And the insects in turn attract all kinds of wildlife that eats insects. So it's a great foraging um, opportunity for all kinds of insect eating wildlife. Um, this tree, the arroyo willow is the host for the Lorquin, the Lorquin's Admiral, Morning Cloak, and again, the Western Tiger, uh, Western Tiger Swallowtail Butterfly. And among the more interesting of the insects, um, willows and especially arroyo willows get um, gall forming insects. And so those galls in turn attract predator insects that come, they've figured out a way to get into the gall and eat the larvae that's on the inside. And so that begins the chain again, that those insects predating on the galls attracts other things that eat insects. So just in general, willows and cottonwoods, um, they are tremendous components of habitats because they harbor lots of insects. And we already mentioned those insects feed lots of other animals. Willows and cottonwoods together are host plants for many, many different uh, species of moths and butterflies. And cottonwoods along with the willows also, or I should say willows along with the cottonwoods also have that soft wood, which is really easy for animals to dig out or burrow into to be able to find places to have dens and places to live. So, um, and I would add here too that all of these trees, the oak trees, the cottonwood trees, and the willow trees are major components of riparian woodlands in California and throughout the Western United States, actually. So this is just an example of riparian habitat um, at the San Luis National Wildlife Refuge. The big, tall, tree, dark trees in the back are cottonwood trees, and the lighter trees in the foreground are willow trees. This is actually a willow tree, too. It's just in the spring when it's uh, blooming with its catkins, and it gives it that golden color. And then I threw this slide in there because I uh, people always talk about, you know, you go to the East Coast to look at all the fall color, and every fall I drive through the Central Valley of California and I think, you know, we have some pretty spectacular fall color as well. Um, the larger picture is a picture of willows turning different colors of kind of gold and red in the fall. And then that inset picture is a red tail hawk sitting in an absolutely burnished gold cottonwood tree against that blue sky, just gorgeous. So after the trees, now we have shrubs. Um, 
lots of interesting shrubs on the wildlife refuge. And this one is called quail bush. Um, a quail bush, I refer to quail bush as a habitat superstar. It provides food, um, not only by, I think, literally millions of seeds that end up being ripe right in the dead of winter when there's not a lot of high protein food out there. The seeds are eaten by birds, by small mammals, um, just about everything eats the seeds. In fact, Native Americans also ate the seeds of quail bush. Um, the leaves even provide food, not only for those small mammals like the rabbits, but um, house finches in particular are especially fond of the young tender shoots of the leaves as they come out in the spring and the adult birds eat them, but they also like to take them to their chicks and feed them to their chicks. Quail bush is a tremendous um, plant when it comes to cover for wildlife. Um, if you were to walk around some of the quail bush that are right by the visitor center at San Luis, if you look down around the base of the plant down in here, you'll see openings like this that lead to little tunnels that lead way into the heart of the shrub. And that's the places where you'll see quail and cottontail rabbits disappear if they think they're being threatened. The quail bush tolerates concentrations of alkalinity and salt in the soil that would kill other plants. And they have a unique mechanism by which they're able to deal with that. Um, the roots of the plant absorb water, of course, that is laden with uh, salts. And as that water moves through the plant's tissue, it actually removes the salts from what they call the cell sap. And on the surface of the leaf, there are um, little, uh, hairs that are called bladder hairs. And it's a fine little hair that extends out from the surface of the leaf. And at the end of the hair is a bladder. So think about like the leaf is a child and it's holding on to a balloon on a string. So the plant is able to transport those salts from the water into the bladder hairs and they go all the way up into the bladder cell that's attached to the end. And that cell can expand like when you inflate a balloon, it expands to many times its original size. When it reaches capacity, um, the bladder cell collapses and it releases all of that salt onto the surface of the leaf. And then it either dries up and it's blown away by the wind or the rain will come along and the rain will wash it off the surface of the leaf. So um, plants like this that are highly tolerant of alkaline and saline conditions have many mechanisms for removing the salt from the plant tissues. And a lot of the mechanisms are very, very similar to that one. Uh, I think I said that the tiny seeds of this bush were also um, consumed by humans. They formed it into a really fine flower called pinole, and then they would eat the pinole either dry or they'd uh, turn it into a mush. So quail bushes are dioecious. That means uh, one plant has the male flowers and the other plant has the female flowers. The plant on the left is the male and what you're seeing are the flowers covered with all the golden pollen. And the two photos on the right are female plants. These are the immature green seeds that hang off in these big trusses of seeds. And as you get later on into the season, more toward late fall and winter, the seeds start to turn purple. And by December or January, the seeds will be dark brown to nearly black. This is a picture of one of the trails on the San Luis Refuge, and it shows real well. Um, these kind of purplish looking shrubs are the female shrubs, and the more golden hued shrubs are the male shrubs. And something very interesting I learned about quail bush is it has a surprising ability in that the plant can switch from male to female and back again. I'm not exactly sure why it would do that, but I have to do a little more research on that. This is another shrub of the wildlife refuge. This is called mule fat. Um, mule fat contributes to the ecosystem in that it's a very late bloomer. Um, it blooms 
uh, from early spring, it, excuse me, it blooms from late summer and fall all the way through early spring. And so that provides a winter source of pollen and nectar for pollinator plants during a time of the year when they're not gonna find much food. Um, mule fat forms really dense thickets and the stems are the stems and branches are very flexible and upright so birds that like to nest in dense cover but only a few feet off the ground like american robins they really like to nest in shrubs like um, mule fat and an interesting thing about the origin of the name of mule fat there's actually some disagreement one possibility suggests that early settlers to California noticed that if their mules and livestock ate the leaves of mule fat, that they stayed nice and plump and nice and fat. Um, other, some scientists have argued with that and said that, no, the leaves of mule fat are really not very nutritious. And the only reason that the mules were fat is because they were really bloated. They weren't being fed very well, they were just bloating. Um, another idea has it that uh, this plant produces resins on its leaf, which make them just a little bit sticky and a little shiny. And they think that maybe the fat in mule fat is actually referring to those shiny resins that are on the leaves. This is coyote bush. It's actually in the same genus as the mule fat, Baccarus. Um, it's another late bloomer, so it provides a critical source of pollen and nectar for winter foraging pollinators. Um, this likes to colonize disturbed areas, especially areas that have been burned. And coyote bushes act as a nurse plant or a nurse shrub. They create little ecosystems like down here beneath the plant where it's a little bit cooler. It's a little bit higher in humidity and there's more moisture in the soil, and that helps um, the young seedlings and saplings of other plants get established because they wouldn't be able to make it out in the, in the full, hot, dry sunlight of the Central Valley and other places where the coyote bush grows. Um, this also hosts a very um, specific gall producing insect. It's a kind of a midge. And like the other galls I mentioned, the midges, their galls in turn attract other insects. So coyote bushes are usually just crawling with insects, which means it's a huge food source for other animals. The source of the name of coyote bush, here again, there's a couple of ideas. Some think it might be because if you look really closely at an individual leaf, it's kind of shaped like a coyote paw. Uh, less a less imaginative idea is that wherever you see coyote bush, you also always see coyotes. So maybe that ecological association is where the name came from. The next plant or the next shrub is iodine bush. And this is actually an area on the San Luis National Wildlife Refuge along the auto tour route called the alkali sink. Alkali sinks are areas which routinely flood and dry out. And because that happens over and over, over the course of millennia, the soils become very, very salty, very, very alkaline. And there's a very specific group of plants and animals that can withstand these conditions. One of them is the coyote bush. Um, if you look at that inset, that kind of close up, it makes me think a little bit of the pickleweed that grows along the coast. The, um, the leaves there are kind of segmented like a pickle, like the pickleweed is. Um, these have very, very tiny seeds. And so of course animals will eat those protein rich seeds, but the seeds were also used by, used by human beings in prehistoric times. Um, as I said, with plants in the alkali sink, this is highly tolerant of alkaline and salty soils. It removes the alkalinities and the salts from the soil and actually takes them up into the plant tissues. And research has shown that plants that can do this may actually be improving the soil in which they grow by making the soils less alkaline and less salty 
and that paves the way for other less tolerant plants to be able to come in and start growing in new areas. Um, they know that um, iodine bush is the host plant for at least a different, a couple of different moth species. Then we have another willow, but this willow really is a shrub. It's not a tree. If you look at this center area right here and this one right here, this is sandbar willow or blue willow. Um, this is a pioneer species. It's often the very first species that will come and start growing in a sandbar that's been opened up or the muddy bank of a river that's been opened up through disturbance. Forms really dense, dense patches of small willows. Um, they shade the water, which there again helps to moderate the water temperatures for things like salmon and other sorts of fish and inverts. Um, it's tremendous shelter and cover for animals. You can have a coyote um, be walking through the center of a patch of blue willow, and you can be walking through that blue willow as well, and you would never know the coyote was there. Um, this flower is early in the year, from February to about April, so this is a real early source of pollen and nectar for our native pollinators. Then we have the elderberry bush. Elderberry likes to grow in riparian areas. It can do with a little bit of drought, but it really prefers to have an area where there's a little bit of extra fresh water available. An interesting thing about elderberry is the roots, the leaves, the stems, and the green berries are pretty highly toxic but the ripe berries are eaten fresh and dry. And so on the left there, you see a beautiful cluster of ripe elderberries and on the lower right are the flowers. Um, the flowers, uh, I think this is another flower that doesn't produce any um, nectar. So pollinators that come to elderberry flowers are harvesting the pollen. And then up there on the upper right, that's an ash-throated flycatcher who's foraging in an elderberry bush, but he's an insect eater, so he's probably not eating the berries. He's probably feasting on the insects that are feeding on the berries. Um, elderberry shrubs provide really good nesting habitat and structure for all kinds of songbirds. Um, this is actually just, it's almost, countless number of birds and animals eat those berries, including human beings, you know, elderberry jam, elderberry jelly, elderberry wine, but steer clear of the green berries and every other part of the plant. And then we have the California wild rose. This forms huge, dense evergreen thickets. And this is a really common plant in Western riparian woodlands. This has a really long flowering period from February to November. And pollinators really like the flat open structure of the flower. Um, this plant produces really small amounts of nectar. So most of the pollinators, again, that are uh, foraging on this plant are actually going after pollen, the insects like the native bees. Um, late in the summer and early fall, it forms, all the flowers form these bright red rose hips and the rose hips hang on to the bush all through the winter and numerous animals, insects, birds, small mammals like rabbits and squirrels, um, even large animals like the deer and the elk, pronghorn when we used to have pronghorn in the valley and bears, if we had them, all eat these rose hips. They go after it for the high vitamin C content in the hip itself and then for the seeds that are inside. And the thickets are excellent cover for birds and, and even elk and deer will hide their youngsters in the thickets of wild rose to protect them from predators. When the If these are growing on the bank of a creek or a stream or something and the, uh, the rose hangs out over the water, then it provides cover for aquatic animals like fish. Uh, another shrub that grows right at the edges of the wetlands is buttonbush. And buttonbush grows across North America, but in the Western United States, or I should say in California, it's found primor primarily in the Great Central Valley. And as I said, it's primarily adjacent to wetlands because it likes a lot of water. Um, 
these are the flowers that inset in the upper left is a cluster of flowers and then the big picture is a single flower that looks a lot like some kind of weird alien little spacecraft or something. Each of these flowers gives way to a fruit when it loses all the little sticky parts. It gives way to these fruits and inside each one of those fruits is about 400 seeds and um, when those seeds are ripe, they're a food source for many species of waterfowl and shorebirds, birds like bitterns, wood ducks, rails and geese, mallards, other kinds of ducks all feed on these. In fact, the picture on the right shows some cattle egrets that are up there, and that's what they were doing is foraging on those um, ripened seed pods. The Bottle bush is, a, or the button bush is especially important for wood ducks because they use the bush to brood and rear their young ducklings. And uh, button bush is considered of special importance to invertebrate, invertebrates. It's a host plant for several species of um, sphinx moth. And the flowers are jam packed with nectar and they attract honeybees. Honeybees forage on them to actually make their honey. Butterflies, moths, beetles, wasps, flies, all kinds of invertebrates go after um, button bush. And the shrub shelters um, and provides nesting structure and cover for all kinds of songbirds. So now we get to the grasses. Oh gosh, it's almost eight o'clock. Um, this is Alkali Sacaton. This is a native bunch grass. Um, here again, this is quite accustomed to high temperatures, to drought, to alkaline and saline conditions. Um, one of the things about Alkali Sacaton is directly underneath those big clumps of grasses in the middle of the summer, if you take a temperature of the soil and then you measure the temperature three or four feet away from the clump out in the open, the soil under the clump will be 15 to 20 degrees cooler than the soil out in the open. And so that's really important for burrowing wildlife like kangaroo rats and ground squirrels. Creeping wild rye, um, this is a plant that just forms these huge giant meadows. It likes water, but it can persist through drought. In fact, when you have years where we have a lot of water, like this past winter, um, these um, patches of creeping wild rye will expand tremendously. And then if we go back into a drought situation, um, the patches will just kind of hold their own and they won't expand. They might even shrink a little, but they can kind of persist. And that inset picture is um, a picture of the seed head of the creeping wild rye. And then salt grass, another highly adaptable, very alkaline and saline tolerant plant has a similar mechanism to the quail bush where it can actually be, remove the salt from the plant tissues. Um, and this forms these huge patches. You can see like a coyote or rabbit trail through there. Um, salt grass forms these gigantic patches that are really resistant to being um, invaded by exotic plant species. I threw this grass in there because I just think it's a beautiful grass in the spring when it's backlit by the sun or whether it's coming up in the morning or setting in the afternoon, it just glows like it's on fire. Um, the foxtail barley or hordium jubatum, it's just a beautiful grass that people are likely to notice when they're driving around the auto routes when they see it all lit up. And then there's just some of the major ways that grasses benefit wildlife, protective cover, Animals are able to move through grasses without being exposed to predators. Nesting habitat for ground nesting birds like meadowlarks, um, quail, uh, nutrition in the leaves, the seeds, and even the insects that are harbored within the grass. The grasses protect pollinators from severe weather. It provides them with nesting structure and nesting material. Um, just uh, grasses should get a lot more credit than we give them sometimes, I think. Um, CC, I see that it's eight o'clock. So should I continue for a few more minutes or? Um, it is eight o'clock. Were you pretty much done or did you have? You know, I have, 
I, I would like to get at least through the aquatic plants and we're just going to have to miss out on the uh, forbs, I guess. Yeah, maybe we can just breeze through them because I am also interested in... Okay, I just have, there are four aquatic plants. I'll try to get through those real quickly. Okay, and then we'll have time for some questions. So if anyone okay. wants to put the some questions in the chat um, while we're going through that, that'd be great. Okay, so uh, the first of the aquatic plants is hard stem bulrush, and you can see down there in the left picture that it forms these tremendously dense stands of what we call emergent vegetation um, throughout the wetlands. And emergent just means that um, the plant grows in the mud that's completely covered by water and the leaves and the stems emerge from the water. So we collectively call these plants tulies. And the pictures on the right show uh, that lower right picture is a black crowned night heron. They roost in the uh, uh, hard stem bulrush during the daytime and come out at night. And then I don't know if you can tell in that upper right picture are two rails. Front left is a Sora and way back in the back on the right is a um, Virginia rail. And they love this dense vegetation. In fact, you will rarely see these birds. You'll most often hear them rather than see them. Almost all parts of this plant are edible. Animals eat the roots, they eat the stems, um, they eat the flowers. These are the flower clusters. These are relished by all kinds of bird species, including waterfowl and things like um, tricolor blackbirds, um, red winged blackbirds, and uh, yellow headed blackbirds. The other plant that we commonly call a tule is the cattail tule. Again, you can see on the bottom, it just forms these dense stands of tules that will shelter birds like those rails and the black crowned night heron. Um, this is a close up of the flower. On the right is the flower, and that's how it got the name cattail tule because somebody thought that looked like a cat's tail. And um, in late winter, early spring, those ripe flowers will burst forth into this fluff and embedded within that fluff are teeny tiny little seeds and the wind carries those across the surface of the water where they land on the water the seeds sink to the bottom down into the mud and they sprout and grow a new cattail plant. The seeds are really small so I don't know how much um, food value the seeds have for wildlife but um, lots of different kinds of wildlife will use that fluff Birds will use it to line their nests, and even small mammals will use it to line their burrows um, before they give birth to their youngsters. And like the bulrush, every part of the cattail is edible. The, the roots underneath the mud and the leaves are all edible by animals and by human beings. Uh, I won't go into this in too much detail, but this just shows at the bottom a cross section of the bulrush stems or leaves on the right and a cross section of the cattail tule leaves on the left. And the top shows the leaves split down the middle. And that's just to show those empty chambers. It's kind of like um, styrofoam or a sponge. And this actually has to do with an adaptation for these plants to be able to live with their roots in the water all the time because they can't get air through their roots. They have to get it through their stems. The air enters the stems and just flows down through these chambers all the way down to the roots. And that's how the roots get the air that they need. And then we have a couple of plants that visitors are likely to see on the wetlands. These are floaters. This is called duckweed fern. Duckweed fern can be kind of pinkish or reddish depending on how much sunlight it's getting and what the temperature of the water is. Um, it, another common name is mosquito fern because these um, form such dense, thick mats that it's thought that mosquito larvae are unable to reach the surface of the water for air. Um, so in that way, the plant helps to control mosquitoes. Um, floaters like this help to shade the water and reduce the water temperature, and that benefits invertebrates and fish and things that are growing underneath. Um, 
leaves of this plant and the plant following are super high in omega-3s. So they make a really nutritious food source for all kinds of water birds and waterfowl. And then this is the other floater. This is called common duckweed. Um, common duckweed and other plants in that genus Limna are thought to be the smallest flowering plants known to man. Their flowers are microscopic, but even that small, the flowers still attract flies and mites and teeny tiny little spiders and even some bees sometime. And again, this is a really important food source for waterfowl and for fish. Um, so it's already eight o'clock and I haven't been able to get to any of the Forbes. If anybody has any questions about Forbes that they maybe have seen while they've been visiting the National Wildlife Refuge, you can ask me about it and I might be able to um, tell from your description what the plant might be. The, but, the first question is, uh, is here, Diana asked, does the refuge plan on doing anything about invasives, especially poison hemlock? The refuge is always doing things about invasives. Invasives is a major part of the management that goes on on the wildlife refuge from day to day. But there are different things that have to be taken into account. Um, one of them is, is it just how invasive is it? And is it an exotic plant that actually has some benefit for wildlife? So that's one thing they look at. Another thing they look at is what's it going to take to get rid of the invasive? Sometimes um, the cure is worse than the affliction. There are some plants that are just so tough and so adaptable that it's hard to get rid of them short of nuking them. Um, and so, you know, when it when you think about maybe um, dispensing all kinds of different pesticides and things across the refuge, that is that something that you really want to do? And what are you going to get out of it as far as benefiting wildlife? Um, so there's kind of like a priority hit list and the exotic invasive plants are put on the hit list in priority of which of the ones that we can really do something about, which are the ones that stand to cause the most damage, and which are the ones that maybe have absolutely no benefit to wildlife whatsoever. And that's the way they attack them. The sad truth is that the exotics are here to stay and we're never going to be able to get rid of all of them. That's just the facts, but um, it's part of management of the refuge, as I said, every day. Um, and it was noticed that you, uh, obviously you got cut off before you were able to finish your talk, but um, you didn't really talk much about annuals or wildflowers. Uh, is there not much in the way of annuals there? Well, as I said, uh, as far as this, as far as the San Luis National Wildlife Refuge goes, there's really not much in the way of wildflowers. If you go out to the Kesterson unit of the wildlife refuge in the spring, um, depending on the conditions that year, there can be a pretty good wildflower display out at Kesterson, the annuals and vernal pool plants. And then another place is the Arena Plains unit on the Merced National Wildlife Refuge, but that unit's not open to the public except once a year when we try to do wildflower day out there. So as I stated at the beginning of the presentation, um, the intent for this presentation was to talk about plants that visitors were likely to see whenever they visit the San Luis National Wildlife Refuge. And they're not likely to see wildflowers um, unless they go to Kesterson and then it's only in the spring. And they're not going to see the wildflowers out at Arena Plains unless they are able to sign up for Wildflower Day in May, in March and April. And Cece points out that uh, we have field trips at Kesterson sometimes. Um, another question is, uh, is all the landscaping natural or there uh, is, is there much in the way of restoration efforts out there? Uh, there again, there's restoration going on at the refuge all the time. There's almost always some um, kind of riparian uh, woodland restoration going on in one part of the refuge or another. 
the last five years or so, we've been pretty intensively restoring uh, milkweed habitat for monarch butterflies and other pollinators. Um, there's quite often plant restoration going on inside the tule elk enclosure, and that's just so that we can maintain the highest possible forage quality for the tule elk because they they are inside an enclosed space, and if they run out of resources, they they can't get out to find more. So we really have to be cognizant of the quality of um, the plant community in there because that's what supports the tule elk. So there's almost always some kind of restoration going on someplace on the refuge and definitely someplace in the refuge complex. Uh, Lawrence is hoping that you can uh, stick around and do the Forbes slides for uh, out maybe after the questions. Um, sure, Ron... I have no problem doing that <laughs> as long as uh, I don't even remember how many I have, but yeah, I'd be happy to. Rhonda uh, asks, would you consider gum plant to be an important plant at the refuge? Absolutely. In yeah. fact, it's one of my Forbes. <laughs> um, and also, what is the most important plant for the tule elk to eat? You know, the tule elk are very interesting. They're one of a subspecies of North American elk, and they are the most widely adapted as to what they will eat. Tule elk will eat the largest variety of plants of any of the elk subspecies. Um, they are adapted to browse on the trees and the shrubs. They eat the grasses and forbs, and they even eat the aquatic plants. So there's almost nothing growing in the elk enclosure that the tule elk won't eat. And um, the exceptions would be, you know, they stay away from things like milkweed and they will not eat thistle type plants or plants that have stickery, spiny, you know, or one of my forbs in the presentation is spikeweed. Um, they would forage on spikeweed when it's really young and tender, but once it's grown up a little bit and it's developed those tough spikes, they won't eat that. But other than those plants, tule elk will eat just about every vegetative thing that's in their habitat, as I said, including aquatic plants. Um, right before we let everyone in, you were talking about the elk, and you said mm -hmm. that um, that they had about 40, uh, it was it 60 elk, and they were able to take some of the elk and put them elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um in order to to help out another one then you also mentioned that uh you mentioned pronghorn and you said that you used to have them but you don't anymore is there another refuge out there that has pronghorn that maybe you can get some of their uh extra pronghorn yeah pronghorn um the the great grazers that migrated up and down the length of california before it was widely settled by human beings, were the tule elk, the black-tailed deer, the pronghorn, and the American bison. Um, so today we have tule elk, and they're not, you know, roaming quite as freely and quite as widely as they used to be, and they're not in the numbers that they used to be. The black-tailed deer have been reintroduced to the valley floor um, about 20 years ago, so that now on the refuge, there's a fairly large population. They estimate it to be around 200 animals. But the pronghorn, um, there are pronghorn up in the very farthest northeastern part of the state, and there are some pronghorn down in the Carrizo Plain. But the last thing I've read about the pronghorn down there is that they're not doing very well. And I don't know if they really have a handle on why they're not doing very well, but but they're not. So um, I know I've been to Carrizo Plain three or four times and I have yet to see a pronghorn, even though they're there. And then of course the bison, um, you know, we, we all know what happened to the American bison. They just are not in California anymore at all, unless they're in, in captive herds. And then um, uh, uh, I was going to say, I think you asked, was there any plan on bringing them back? Um, the manager for the San Luis Refuge, who has since moved on to another assignment, 
he was an ungulate biologist and his dream for the San Luis National Wildlife Refuge was to have uh, the elk, the deer, and the pronghorn free roaming across the refuge. And uh, he did not get to see that happen, but I know that's still a dream of his is to someday have the elk out of the enclosure and have pronghorn back on the refuge. So we'll see if that happens. Cool. Um, and then uh, does water hemlock have any positive value or is it one of the invasives you hope to get rid of? Water hemlock or poison hemlock? Uh, well, they, this is Rhonda and she asked about water hemlock. Uh, are you talking about water hyacinth? Uh, maybe she is. Water hyacinth is a floating plant um, that just completely clogs up the waterways, um, forms these dense floating mats with strikingly beautiful purple flowers. But it does, they use a tremendous amount of water. So we're losing volumes and volumes of water to them. And they completely cover the water surface so that um, no sunlight, no nothing gets through into the water at all. And it impedes the flow of water. Um, there are different organizations, um, state organization and county organizations that work with the refuge on a regular basis to go in and remove hemlock from the different waterways. The problem is that hemlock is, or excuse me, water hyacinth, if that's the one she's talking about, is kind of like Bermuda grass. You can dig Bermuda grass out, but if you leave one teeny tiny little piece of rhizome with a node on it, you get a whole new population of Bermuda grass. Water hyacinth is the same way. If you leave one tiny little piece hiding behind a clump of coolies somewhere, in five years, you're completely choked out with water hyacinth again. So it's an ongoing thing that it happens every few years. They go in and pull it all out. And um, do you find that they eat too much ever like deer? Let's see, I'm trying to figure this. That they eat too much ever like deer is that oh my gosh issue? wait i'll uh -oh. just i'll just read what i was gonna say um i would that comment was when we were talking about the tule elk and what they like to eat so i was wondering do you ever do you find that they eat too much of in their enclosure of what you have planted like do you um you mean to you the point where they up? might run out of food or that they might harm themselves yeah are you able to keep up with their um like you know like deer they'll eat all the plants or sorry my baby just got home okay um yeah they the tule elk have been there since um i want to say 1973 and it's a common question from people do we ever have to feed them um, is there enough food in there for them? And the answer is we have never had to feed the tule elk. About, I want to say it was about seven or eight years ago, we were well into the drought and there was one year where we hadn't gotten a drop of rain and it was coming on like the middle of December or nearly Christmas and we hadn't had a drop. And the refuge managers were putting the plans together to start figuring out where they're going to get food and bring food in for the tule elk. And then the rains came and it rained the rest of the winter and everything was fine. So there was that one scare where we thought we were going to have to feed them, but we didn't have to, and we have never had to. But that is why every five years or so, they remove part of the herd and relocate them somewhere else because they don't ever want them to reach the carrying capacity of that enclosure. We don't ever want to have to feed them because these are wild animals. And when you start feeding them, it's in a way, it's a degree of domestication and we don't want to go there. Um, and Diana asks, uh, does she know anything about the fields of wildflowers, cold fields, et cetera? they were farming outside of the refuge in spring and what were the seeds used for? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's very observant. Um, that land on the uh, 
that would be the east side of the road when you're driving into the refuge. That land is owned by Bowles Farms, which is a major farming operation in the Las Banas area. And a few years ago, um, Bowles Farms decided that they wanted to get into production of native plants for habitat restoration. And so that's what they were growing out there. They were growing, uh, one of the things they're particularly interested in is pollinator habitat restoration throughout California. And so what you saw growing there alongside Wolfson Road this spring were uh, many different species of native flowering plants that are good uh, pollinator habitat plants. And so when they took those all out, they actually harvested the seed. And then that seed will be used either to sell to people uh, with restoration projects who want to plant the seed themselves, or Bowles Farm may use the seed to propagate plants and then sell the plant plugs um, for restoration projects throughout the state. So um, apparently water hemlock, which is uh, the scientific name, Secuta diplocii, um, it's a wetland plant commonly known uh, and found in wet meadows and pastures and along banks of streams. It's in the parsley family and it starts growing in the spring. And uh, it's got, uh, so it's, it looks more like um, poison hemlock, but it's water hemlock. It's more of a, a wetland kind of plant. And that's okay. the one she's talking about. That but one it's, not, it's not actually a not like a hyacinth or a duckweed or something like that. That one I'm not familiar with. In fact, I'd have to actually look on the refuge's plant list and see if they even list that plant on there. Is that something um, you said that was Rhonda? Is that something? Ron, yeah, Rhonda um, is the is one who was asking about that. Is that something she's actually that. seen on the refuge? Rhonda. She, she, she I'm said, muted. Hi. Uh, I thought I had seen it there, but I could be wrong. I'll, I know it's, take, I think it's at the Merced Refuge. Well, that's very possible. I'll take a look on the plant list and see if they list it on the plant list and I'll, no I'll do problem. Some, okay, we got I'll about eight minutes. Around. Let's see your Forbes. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, why don't you go into Forbes? You You want me to do the Forbes? Yeah, go for the Forbes. Everybody How does Zoom work? Does that. it kick you off when you get to the end of your time? Oh, no, no. no. Go, go, if we go to 10 o'clock, of course, we'll lose all our people. But just go ahead and, uh, just go ahead, uh, you know, they'll drop off if they, if they uh, want Okay, to. well, all right, here we go. So here we are, gum plant. Um, so gum plant, like so many other of our species of plants here in the valley, thrives in hot summers. It thrives in low humidity in highly alkaline soils. Um, the flowers are an important pollinator source, but an interesting characteristic of the plant is that the entire plant, especially the buds, like you can see over in the right picture, um, are covered with this sticky milky substance. And it's believed that that substance protects the plant from herbivory. And indeed, I would think that those spiky little protrusions from that bud might also protect it from being eaten. And it's also thought that the sticky substance protects that young tender bud from being damaged by really intense ultraviolet rays. But as a member of the sunflowers family, uh, in the center of that disc, it produces lots of good plump seeds in there that make great food for seed eating birds. Um, spikeweed, this is another uh, member of the sunflower family. And this is one I was talking about that when this plant is very small, young and tender, uh, grazers like the tule elk will eat it. But when it gets to be full size, it gets pretty spiky and not very palatable at all. Um, there are two or three different um, spikeweed or hemizonia species on the refuge, and some hemizonia species are endemic. These are another important pollinator plant, especially from different species of moths. And spikeweed is considered to be part of any healthy grassland ecosystem. It's drought tolerant in the extreme, 
its seeds don't even require water to germinate. So it's a pretty tough little plant. All the stalks, the leaves, everything are covered with really fine hairs that have little oil glands on them. And those sticky oils, uh, uh, they attract and trap insects. And then once the insects are stuck on there, they become carrion for predator insects. And apparently those predator insects are ones that evolved specifically with spikeweed and they kind of hunt the spikeweed looking for those other insects that are stuck in the goo. Um, and then those predator insects in turn, any plant, as we mentioned before so many times, any plant that attracts a lot of insects is going to attract a lot of wildlife that eats insects. Um, the seeds are eaten by all kinds of animals and human beings even ate the seeds. Once they're ripe, they would roast them like we roast sunflower seeds. So um, that tells me that it's a, a pretty meaty seed that provides a lot of food material in there. And going back to those insects that get stuck in the sticky goo, um, if they die and they become carrion and nothing comes along to eat them, then as they decay, they themselves become nutrients for the plant. So quite a little system there. Um, this little forb is called alcohol, alkali heath and it's got teeny itty bitty tiny little leaves and teeny tiny little flowers that are great pollinator uh, attractants for our very small, tiny, uh, native wasps and native bees. And these pictures show how alkali heath can form these really dense mats. So this is another native plant that can be really resistant to be invaded by exotic plant species. And um, those really dense, in some places, the plant will form a really dense mound. And those mounds of plants provide cover for little animals close to the ground like lizards that need to get out of the intense heat of the noonday sun, so to speak. Um, this is another plant that avoids damage to its tissues by high alkalinity and high salinity by actually removing the salts from the plant and transporting them to the surface of the leaf where then it can, it can get rid of it. All of those plants that do that, if you look at the plants and look at the surface of the leaf close up, you see what looks like shiny little crystals on the surface of the leaves. And those are actually the granules of salt that have been transported out of the plant. This is alkali mallow. This is another pioneer species, one that moves in and colonizes um, a landscape that's been disturbed. This is another plant that thrives in really difficult conditions, including um, high salinity and high alkalinity, hence the name alkali mallow, hence the name alkali heath. Um, that's exactly what these species are adapted to do. Um, one of, I found a really fun fact about the mallow plant. There's another species of mallow that's very closely related to this one but um, it's actually native to parts of Europe, Western Asia, and Northern Africa. And the Egyptians, more than 4,000 years ago, used that mallow plant, which is called a marshmallow. They pounded the roots of the marshmallow, and then they combined it with some kind of a mucilaginous substance, and then they sweetened it with honey, and they made what's believed to be the very first marshmallow. That's where marshmallows came from. But in the Egyptian times, marshmallows were only for only to be fed to the elites and to be put in the tombs for the gods. They were not for the common everyday peasant people. They didn't get to enjoy marshmallows. Yerba mansa is an interesting plant that grows in really wet, boggy areas of the refuge. Um, it has a really strong fragrance that I equate to something like uh, eucalyptus or menthol. It's, I find it to be actually quite pleasant. Um, it's also called lizard's tail, and that's because supposedly somebody thought that inflorescence looked like the tail of a lizard. 
um, I don't know if they're looking at the scales or or what they're looking at there. I think that might be a little bit of a stretch, but who knows when it comes to names. Um, this is a plant that in the complete absence or low population numbers of pollinators, this plant can reproduce completely clonally so that you end up with these giant expansive patches where all of the plants are genetically identical to each other. That um, inset picture in the lower right shows what happens to the flowers at the end of summer going into fall. They, the whole flower will turn into that bright red color, which is kind of attractive. And this is another one of those plants that it forms these great dense patches. And so it becomes really resistant to being invaded by exotic invasive plant species. Uh, this is alkali heliotrope. Here again, alkali is in the name, and that tells you that this plant is at least somewhat resistant to high levels of alkalinity and salinity in the soil and in the water. Um, this is considered to be a butterfly magnet. There was a 34-year study conducted in Central California, and it found a wide variety of butterflies that visit heliotrope every single day throughout the season. And they were butterflies that included things like um, the gray hair streak butterfly, Akamon blue, the buckeye butterfly, and many others. I couldn't even find a list that showed all the different kinds of butterflies that like this plant. But if you wanna see butterflies when you are walking along one of the trails out in the refuge and you find a patch of heliotrope in the summer, just stand there and watch for a while and you're gonna see butterflies and little bees and wasps all over it. It's really cool when you look at the um, flowers close up, you see some of them have a yellow throat and some of them have a purple throat. And I'm not exactly sure why that is. I think it has something to do with how old the flower is. The flower starts out one color and then as the flower ages, it changes to another color. Um, milkweed, the milkweed that is most common to these wildlife refuges is narrow leaf milkweed. And this is narrow leaf milkweed as it's just beginning to flower but it's you 